Welcome to the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Lace up those boots and sling on the pack for a romp through trails, short and long. With your host and renaissance man, Doc, it's time to embrace the suck. Welcome back to another week on the trail, dirt bags and hiker trash. I'm Doc and this is the John Freakin' Muir Pod. Let's start off with a reminder. If you are enjoying the podcast, take just a minute, help us out, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. And if you're not enjoying the pod, well, just go ahead and keep that to yourself. All right. It's back to the skies again this week as we take another look at wingsuit flying. We had such a great time talking to Moab Joe in episode 32 about his high flying adventures in Utah that I thought it would be worth our time exploring another aspect of this wild sport, wingsuit base jumping. Helping us explore this is wingsuit flyer Zishan Parvez. Welcome to the John Freaking Muir Pod. How's it going, Zishan? It's going pretty good. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, on the podcast, we we generally talk about hiking, hiking stuff, and uh, you know, outdoor adventure, and we usually go by trail names. Trail names. It's a a, a particular long trail, American long trail tradition, where along the trail. You pick up a, a nickname, a trail name, usually based on maybe where you're from, some kind of peculiarity you might have, or maybe something that happened to you on the trail. Is there any such similar tradition in the skies above the country? Oh, man. I, yeah, I don't think we have something like that. Um, we usually just make up our own names uh, off the fly. I usually take the nickname Z. Um, because it's a little less um it's a little more convenient for my um my native friends <laughs> but yeah no we don't have anything uh as specific as that but you can call me z okay uh, that is i guess could be my trail name <laughs> all right we will we will go by z i'm doc you can call me doc it's not it's not on my driver's license or on my paycheck but uh, <laughs> that's that's the trail name so doc and z talking about wingsuit base jumping yep yeah yep. okay now, have you had a chance to listen to the podcast? I have not, not fully. Um, okay. I'm usually busy with my PhD program in the middle, but I've read awesome. up on uh, Moab Joe. I know him quite well, actually. Oh, really? Okay, cool. Yeah, it's a small community. Uh, we all, all base jumpers usually know each other. We've done some uh, uh, events out at Scott of Elsinore. Um, there's some big way events with him as well. Very good. Now, this episode all came together because out of the blue, I don't know if you know this or not, but out of the blue, I was contacted by a UCLA student who was looking to do some interning on a podcast, and and she was a, a fan of my podcast, and so she reached out, and I said, absolutely, I would love to have you. We kind of outlined some different uh, areas that she could help me out with, and one of the things was to scare up some talent. You know, we're always on the on the lookout for some some good talent to have on the show and and talk to and share some stories. And you were the first person that she sent my way. And lo and behold, you're here right now <laughs> talking. Well, I'm glad I'm here now. Uh, but yes, uh, I believe uh, I knew one of her friends who uh, uh, actually accompanied me on one of the jumps uh, somewhere in the California region, and. Uh, they were kind of quite t- taken back by uh, that actual part of uh, outdoor adventure. They're avid climbers, um, so they're part of that community. And the wingsuit base and climbing community are actually quite intermingled together. So um, we kind of participate in both if we are in both spheres. So uh, I'm glad they contacted uh, they contacted me for this. Yeah, so this is our first official shout out to Intern Angela. Welcome to the podcast, Intern Angela, and thank you so much for uh, for sending Z our way for this for this episode. And the reason I asked you if you'd listen to the podcast before, I wasn't searching for for you know uh, any any compliments <laughs> or anything like that. I want to make sure that you are aware of a segment we do towards the end of each episode called the Pro Tip Inside of the Week, and that's where you will have a chance to share some. I usually call it trail wisdom. But I'm going to call it outdoor adventure wisdom. Uh, for to our listeners to make their next outdoor experience even better. So uh, just know that you're going to be on the hook towards the end of the episode to, sh- to share some wisdom out there. Oh, I got, I, I got you. I, I'll think of something uh, on the fly. Okay. <laughs> All right. 
the must bring gear review hey another feature we've been doing this season is the must bring gear review sponsored by the ultralight backpacking gear company six moon designs and here's how it works if you're to let a stranger pack your bag with pretty much generic gear for a multi-day adventure what is the one specific piece of gear you would insist on being packed and if you've got a particular brand for that specific piece of gear even better so z soon to be dr z what is your must bring piece of gear on one of your adventures out there I would have to say um, the Garmin inReach, um, the personal locator beacon that also has a two-way uh, text feature. It's definitely something that is important to uh, any outdoor adventure. Whenever you leave a uh, signal from anywhere, and this is coming from my uh, uh, experiences in the special operation community as a uh, communication operator, comms are very important if you're not communicating with anybody you're on your own and the garmin inreach is something that is built into all of my kit regardless if it's wingsuit base if it's going hiking if it's anywhere out in the uh great wide nature in nature it is something that uh you must have so i always carry mine i have the very basic plan but uh, yeah, the Garmin in reach is definitely one of the most important things that I have on me. Well said, well said. Now you mentioned special ops, which piqued my interest and then communication operator. So what, <laughs> tell us about that. What's that all about? Oh yeah. Uh, so I don't think this was brought up, but I was uh, actually a MARSOC operator. Um, back then it was called the critical skills operators and now it's called they're uh, named the Raiders. So every military um uh, br branch has a special operation team, Navy SEALs, Army SF, Marines have MARSOC, and Air Force have Fire Rescue. So I was on the Marine Corps side of the house with uh, MARSOC. And my speciality was uh, communications and explosives, uh, kind of very disparate uh, activities. But um, that's what I, my team came to me for expertise in because I trained with those two specific elements. So communications was a huge part. And I was always uh, first to be tapped, like, hey, we need to get comms up in any form, any way, um, on any mission. And that was my job. So you know what you're talking about. And I have to say that, you know, in our interviews here on the podcast, we talked to a, a wide range of badasses. And uh, I think with those credentials, you may you may rise to, to near the top of the, uh, the badass <laughs> rankings. So uh, thank you very much for, for, for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. It's the hiking pole. All right. The hiking pole. And, you know, when I send you, when I, when I coordinate with my guests, I always send them an outline of what we're going to be talking about. But strategically, I do not share what's, what is the hiking pole? I don't, I don't share what the questions are. So this is a surprise. Oh, wow. Oh, great. <laughs> for Z. Now, it says hiking pool, and so you would assume that the questions are about hiking, but they're not. These, I, mm -hmm. I changed up after a few episodes, and I decided, you know what? This is a chance for me to really wrestle with the big issues of our day. These are the, the very important, gut-wrenching, soul-dividing soul issues that we deal with on a daily basis. And so I'm going to ask you seven questions, and this is going to help me rate you on the sanity scale. I'm going to give you a score at the end of this with zero being, you know, completely bonkers and 100 being completely sane. So somewhere you're going to fall in that range based on your answers on this, uh, this seven question hiking poll. Oh, geez. Okay. <laughs> all right, you nervous, you nervous at all? Uh, just a tad bit. <laughs> tad bit. Okay. All right. Now, if, if I were to ask your friends, Hey, give Z a ranking from zero to a hundred on how sane he is. What, what what do you think the typical response would be from the people that know you? Uh, people that know me best, probably I would say as far as sane, maybe I'll, I'll say somewhere 75% uh, to say sanity. Okay. People so, that know me the best, for okay. sure. So you're mostly sane then to your, to most uh, of your, to your good friends. I would, I would hope so. Okay. Now I have to tell you, there's an automatic 25 point deduction for anybody that jumps out of a properly working plane for no good reason. 
Oh, geez. Uh, 25 point deduction. So I'm already at 75%. That's right. You, if you're completely saying the rest of the way, then you would end up with a 75 on this. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. You ready? Yeah, let's go. Here we go. Question number one, Netflix or YouTube? YouTube. For sure. Okay. You broke up a little bit there. I think you said YouTube. Yep, I said YouTube. Okay, and and why is that? We always like to have a little bit of explanation with the answer there. I like the idea of uh, user-generated content. It seems more real. Um, a, a lot more kind of organic. Um, you can get someone, you can pay them a bunch of money and have them re replicate a certain incident or a certain activity or event and stuff, and it, it fits the Hollywood uh, role but I like to have real content and that's why I like user generated stuff. You know, the guy at the bottom of the totem pole guy or girl at the bottom of the totem pole. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. Now the explanations are important because sometimes uh, I will get an answer that I don't agree with. And this whole score is based on whether or not you agree with my, my uh, point of view, but if oh. you can explain <laughs> your way around it, I mean, that's, that, that certainly helps your case. So uh, that's, that's a good explanation. User generated okay. content. Okay. All right, question number two. What would be your most useful skill in case of a zombie apocalypse? Ooh, ooh zombie apocalypse. Um, God, I've watched way too many Resident Evil movies and uh, zombie movies. I, I guess I'm a pretty good shot. Um, so, yeah, uh, I... I'm a firearm instructor, so I guess uh, firearms. Uh, yeah, I guess I would be the bodyguard or the person that would be protecting the entire group. Yeah, Marine Special Forces. I think I think you bring a lot to the table in that in that special circumstance. <laughs> yeah, so I'm going to go with that. Okay, all right. Question number three: Does pineapple belong on pizza? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a easy yes. I absolutely love pineapple on pizza. I actually look, I had to look this up online. I think it's like 10% of people actually like that. And I'm definitely in the minority, but I'm going to stick with it. Pineapples on pizza are actually amazing. I'm going to say you're in the top 10% because, you know, I agree. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Unless you're doing great at this point. <laughs> yep. Yep. No, no major point deductions other than the 25 at this point. So you're doing well, doing well. All right. all right all right question four do you roll your toilet paper over or under oh over i mean uh, under is crazy definitely over the top uh under is just uh that's some serial killer vibes <laughs> <laughs> yes yes it is and, and i want to see how committed you are to this this viewpoint if you're at a friend's house or a family member with whom you don't live and you're on the throne and you notice uh, that it goes under, do you take the time to fix that problem for them? I mean, you got to, um, yeah, you can't have anyone else go on the throne and be like, Hey, my family members are insane over here. So yep, you got to fix it. Excellent. Okay. That was question four. Question five is cereal a soup. Cereal a soup. Yeah, is cereal, um, is cereal, can, can cereal be considered a soup? What is the maybe, definition of soup and does cereal qualify? I don't know. I think the crunchy texture might throw it off a little bit. Um, but okay, so that's tough. That's very tough because mm -hmm. I throw crackers into my soup all the time, like Cheez-Its into anything. And that's my, on my jet boil as well. Cook soup on it, throw some Cheez-Its, that's it. So I guess, damn. Okay, I'm going to go with yes. Uh, just because the texture, yes, it might be a little off for some individuals. Some people like the uh, you know, non crunchy texture, but if you're going to look at the sheer definition, it is swimming in some sort of uh, liquid. Uh, yeah, I'm going to go with, yeah, I guess you could consider it a soup. Okay, it does not have to be hot. I mean, we all know that there's cold soup out there. Exactly. Sometimes yeah. I prefer cold soup. Okay. All right. Was that question four or five? Uh, I think it was five. Five. Okay. Question six, would you rather always live 10 miles from where you were born 
or never be able to settle down in one place for more than a year? Huh. Uh, one mile, uh, not, no, not one mile from where I was born. Uh, never travel. I want to travel a little bit more. So I kind of bounce back and forth. I like, uh, getting out there and kind of living, uh, adventurous. So let's, okay. uh, go with the second option. Okay. So the nomadic lifestyle. Yeah. Okay. And question number seven, I had this, I had this particular, uh, real life experience just recently. So should the person in the middle seat of an airplane get both armrests? I mean, that's a tough one. Cause it's, yeah, that's a tough one. I mean, I think, I think they should because they're in the middle of the seat. I mean, at least the only the comfort that they can have, is having both armrests because you're in the middle. You can't go left or right. I mean, they, they can use one. And, you know, they could also, with that uh, added space, it makes it more comfortable for you. So I would say, yeah, you, they should definitely have uh, the option for that. That's right. I mean, the guy, the, the, the guy, the person on the aisle, he has easy access to the bathroom to get up, whatever he, whatever he or she needs to do. The person next to the window gets the window. I mean, there's got to be some perk for, for being in the middle. Yep. Uh, ooh, that last part broke up, but uh, yeah, no, 100% agree. Yeah, there has to be some perk for being in the middle. And I was on a plane last week, and my wife was towards the window. I was in the middle seat. It was a full flight, and guy shows up and sits down in the aisle seat and proceeds to try and take both armrests. I had to, I had to go back and forth with him a little bit. We never exchanged any words or anything, but every chance I got, I, I slid my elbow in there to get that that second armrest. <laughs> Just being aggressive with it, uh, you gotta assert your, uh, gotta get your territory, especially if you if you deserve it, for sure. That's right, especially if you deserve it. All right, hey, let me do a quick calculation here. I'm gonna add this up here. I gotta carry the two. We're gonna divide by pi, multiply that by root seven, and we're gonna factor in the speed of terminal velocity, since that's a term that uh, we may be talking about tonight during the episode. <laughs> and I come up with a solid score. Just minimal deductions here of 68. 68. 68. Well done. Okay. Well done, Z. Very cool. You know, I've had I've had some of my okay. former guests, they get the score and they they go out and they buy a hat with the, you know, with the score embroidered on it. You know, it's just kind of a badge of honor. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if you want to do that or not. It's up to you. Totally up to you. 68. I don't know. You might see me with uh, some uh some patch of 68. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, before we get too far down the trail, let's back up a little bit. We want to hear about uh, how you got your start in all this. You know, you want to hear about your background growing up, playing sports and hobbies as a kid. And how did you get involved in the outdoor adventure cult, specifically jumping out of properly working airplanes or jumping, so, off, of, jumping off of cliffs or bridges or antenna spans, antenna, t- antenna towers? Yep. Uh, so, I mean, I started off... Uh, not super outdoorsy. I was actually kind of against outdoor lifestyle for a little bit. I liked the comfort of indoors uh, when I was younger, um, which um, was kind of a thing. I played the normal sports, uh, football, wrestling, and everything like that. And then I was at the end of my high school career, and I was like, you know what? I need to do something with my life. Um, I used to do ROTC equivalent, a JROTC equivalent to call the Naval Sea Cadet Corps. Um, so I got kind of, uh, put into that whole lifestyle. We started doing more outdoor activities. Uh, I mean, that's what the military is all about. And I kind of got more assimilated into it. And then when I graduated from high school, I went straight to the Marines, got selected for MARSOC. And that is all outdoors. I mean, you're outdoors more than you want to be, uh, most times. But, um, yeah, I've learned quite a few uh, tips and tricks to live outdoors, uh, survival school, um, a bunch of other schools on top of that, um, how to pack your uh, pack and everything, how to set your gear up for uh, certain operations and stuff. And I kind of just, you know, took that over when I got out of that uh, area. I wanted to kind of revisit it and keep it consistent in my life in my undergrad and grad uh, programs. I just uh, kept doing it and wanted to kind of 
reconnect and kind of stay engaged with it. So that's how I got my start in wingsuits uh, or just skydiving in general, because I wanted to stay consistent with what I used to do in the military. And for those of you who don't know, uh, getting out of the military is actually very difficult, especially if you have a certain occupation. Um, lifestyle outside of the that community is very different. If you come from an operational unit that deploys to country X that you never hear about, you come to a class and you're sitting next to individuals who don't have that set of experience, you can't really connect and it creates a somewhat of disconnect. So with that, to stay consistent with who I was, I picked up some extreme sports. Uh, skydiving was the first one. Then when I kind of got into grad school, I started getting into wingsuiting because I was seemed pretty interesting to me. And from wingsuiting, a lot of the wingsuit community is our base numbers. So I was like, you know what? Let's see what that's all about. And that's when I started getting into the outdoor, like really uh, honing in my outdoor experiences with uh, that. Because a lot of the actual base jumping in the mountains requires competency and skill outdoors. So we use the same stuff, same gear as you would in um, through hiking or camping or backpacking and so forth. Um, that uh, a lot of the skill set bleeds over. So that's what I kind of do is like, I actually enjoy the outdoor community now and I actually love um, kind of taking what I used to know in the military or what I still know and keeping it consistent with my lifestyle. So that's how I ended up in wingsuit base and wingsuit skydiving. Uh, wingsuit base jumping is just a more extreme form of it. And um, with that, uh, wingsuit base requires, especially in the U.S., requires long hikes, uh, skill with climbing with uh, mountaineering, uh, albinism, uh, I believe it's albinism, yeah, in some cases, and just uh, knowing weather, uh, being, I guess it's kind of out there, but being one with the mountain, but understanding what the mountain is actually telling you. Um, so that's super important. And that's what I really like. After five miles away from the beach, I never go to the beach. I always go an hour and a half to the mountains or more. Got it. Z, Z, you covered a lot of ground right there. I've got some questions, some follow-up questions. Okay. So first thing, I don't think we heard where you, where you grew up. Where, where did you, when did you, where did you spend your, your, your uh, formative years? Oh, okay. So that's why when you asked that uh, you want to live 10 miles or one mile from where you lived, I actually moved the furthest away from that. So I was, I'm from North uh, New, Newport, Rhode Island was where I was born. And okay. I moved down the road to North Kingstown, Rhode Island. It's where I lived for the majority of my life. So all the way on the East Coast at the furthest point in the smallest state. Um, but yeah, that's uh, where I'm from. Okay. And now you're in Lake Elsinore, California? No, Nope. I'm uh, actually in uh, West or Brentwood, Los Angeles area. Brentwood. So, okay. Got yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You're not that, you're a little bit south of me. You're not too far away. Yeah, definitely not. Now you mentioned the Marsoc training program. Tell us about that. I mean, because we, we we've heard we've heard about, or I've heard about, uh, you know, I've heard stories about you know the Navy SEALs and what it takes to become a Navy <laughs> SEAL or or an Army Ranger. I mean, how what is the training program like for for uh, for Marsoc? It it is pretty uh, difficult. Um, a lot of it, so. Marsoc takes a lot of its um, experiences from all the different branches what has uh, is working and they kind of assimilate it in. So it is full on um, when you get into, so you have to get selected to get in. And that is a, a pretty tough, um, pr tough undertaking. Um, it's, I can't, I don't know. I can't tell you, say too much about it, um, but it, it is a, long period in the middle of nowhere and you are uh you don't know what's going on and it is um like it's it's a gentleman's evaluation um it's it's a very they just want the right people and they have ways to do it and they put you to the test in some of the most physically demanding and definitely mentally demanding ways uh, imaginable and the mental component in any special operation community is far more superior than any other uh, attribute you have to be mentally strong to do that and uh, yeah and that just propagates through the year-long training after that you go through a year-long training of just everything um seer school survival school um light infantry tactics amphibious warfare um 
you learn how to drive aggressively and take cars off the road, just like uh, cops would. Um, you learn about mobile force protection. You learn about calling for a fire. It just go through everything you could possibly learn. Uh, human, like basically uh, relationship development with foreign contacts and like, how do you actually build rapport with individuals? Um, the new age of uh, warfare, uh, how do like, sometimes if with a operator, a special operator, the most weapons the mind weapon the tools the mind and how you navigate problems in a out of box thinking way is what makes a operator um an operator uh i mean you could put anyone behind a firearm but uh, making a decision understanding that and understand the ramifications for your decision especially in high stakes scenarios where it could be it, there's a lot more riding on it than just hey you and an enemy uh, it's it's huge so yeah it, that's that's kind of i know i'm ambiguous about it just because a lot of it's secretive um and they keep it that way but uh it it is more or less uh going through hell and back so i, I can understand secretive and uh it, it it sounds like it sounds grueling and it's supposed to be grueling because you're you're trying to determine uh, what what level of mental and physical uh, toughness your candidates are, right? And so mm-hmm. this is a year long process. How many how many candidates started out the training with you? Oof. Um, I'll, I I guess I could say this uh, as assessment selection. I I would say we started off with around a hundred. On th- now this is back back in the day uh, assessment selection. Uh, oh, at a hundred. Okay. Candidates. And how many? And uh, how many? Yeah. How many? How many actually made it to Marsoc? To start the program, not a lot. I would say fifteen to twenty. Okay, so of the original yeah. hundred, about fifteen percent, twenty percent actually made it. Yeah, that's what I would uh, approximate the number to be. Okay, all right. Now you also mentioned uh, after. After you do that that training and, and you go through the evaluation period and you make it, then then they sent you to another year long experience of different types of survival situations or survival schools. Uh, they sent you to your pipeline or a training program of uh, everything built into it. Uh, survival school is one aspect of it. I just bring it up because it was really it was uh, yeah it was it was aggressive. Um, they starve you for quite a while and you, they change your behavior up uh, based off that. But with that, it's, you just go through an entire series of schools, um, everything to build capacity and also, geez, my internet connection is stable, build capacity and also um, build a general baseline of an operator. Then from there, you can advance schools afterwards, but the baseline school, you have to go through everything. And it's, yeah, so that selection process just to see if you're good enough to go there, and there are people that drop out during that course too. Mm-hmm. And so after that year long experience, how many of the original 100, which have been whittled down to 15 to 20, how many how many are left after that? Oh, um, the attrition rate after that is very small because they do a really good job at the original. Um, we got uh, assimilated into another class, so it's a little bit harder to kind of. Uh, differentiate that but i would say probably down to 13 yeah 13 or so okay now you went straight into the marines after high school what, what, what was your what were your family's thoughts about that did they have uh, other ideas for you or they're they're fully supportive they had strong opinions on uh, going a different route uh, my parents were very much the traditional south asian uh parents uh you can either be a doctor a lawyer or engineer but the world is yours uh to do any of those um so i i, I wanted something else and i think it's important to have different experiences so i'm glad i went that way and i think my parents are as well um because on the other side it, you come out as a much better individual for it and what are their feelings or thoughts on wingsuit base jumping? <laughs> uh, I don't like to look into it too much or read into it too much. Um, they, I try not to send them too many videos um, of anything, but 
uh, my mom's always like, oh my God, what are you doing with your life? At this point, she's like, why don't you get married or something? But um, settle down. But I mean, I don't know. It's, um, it, it's, yeah, it's there. My dad's like, yeah, that's actually really cool and stuff. So they're supportive, but they are a little, uh, they try to keep it somewhat uh, like, hey, this is, they don't, they don't try to research the activity and statistics and everything like that. So I guess um, not knowing is a, a good thing too. Okay. Now me, me being on the outside, looking in, you know, hearing this from you, tell me, tell me if I have the, the wrong point of view or if, if it's accurate, it seems like your experience in the military and your escalation to, to MARSOC and, and all of those experiences, which sound like some pretty extreme experiences that kind of led to you investigating other extreme experiences beyond that, like, like skydiving, like wingsuiting. Uh, is that is that an accurate kind of progression, or am I am I off a little bit? No, you're actually 100 percent right. Uh, you want to stay consistent with who you are, um, and this is just who I am. I find it uh, the extreme aspect isn't the actual that I take away from it. It's actually the process, which is consistent with the special operation teams, very much so in Wingsy Base. So. Yeah, you're 100 percent right. It, you were not searching for another dream. We're searching for the right, the same process, and that is why I am gravitating towards it. But it is directly stemming from uh, Marsak. Okay. Now, does does your adrenaline get going with every jump, or because you've done it so much, uh, you don't have that same reaction that maybe your your average person who's never jumped out of a plane or never wingsuited. You know, when they do it for the first time, you know, their, their blood pressure is going to be way up. Their pulse is going to be way up. You know, what, what is the experience for you? The experience in uh, wingsuit skydiving has definitely subsided. And the issue with that is um, that you start losing your edge and you start getting complacent. That's when act- accidents happen and that's when stuff gets dangerous. So try to keep a little bit of oh, the nerves and know what I'm doing and visualize what I'm doing. In the wingsuit base scene, Yes, it does spike. In some cases, it spikes uh, quite a bit, especially on new exits and new activities. And, oh, my God, this happened and this has to happen. Like my, uh, the way I know I'm scared deep down and I'm going, my physiological processes are like, oh, Jesus Christ, like, what are you doing? Like, you should stop, but you're going to keep doing it. My legs start shaking. And I know that is when I'm like, my goodness, uh, that's on the ground usually after the activity. Um, but it's like a way to my body telling me, like, what are you doing? But, um, uh, yeah, the adrenaline does spike in some cases. However, it's controlled. And that's the biggest thing is controlling how you actually experience that, but also knowing that the other side, the flip side is much more dangerous than the adrenaline portion. If you don't have, uh, like some sort of like, Hey, this is a real activity. This is dangerous. You become complacent and that's when things go south fast that's something you can't do so yeah i think it happens in base because i force it to like hey i i'm really thinking about it like everything has to be there and this and that and when it stops happening then i'm i usually take a little bit of a break and you know come back when it, it can come back again i think that's a really good point i mean adrenaline has evolved in us the the adrenaline response has evolved in us for a reason right it, it, it heightens our awareness. It, 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 uh, it, it, it influences our decision-making. Um, and you know, it, it is there for a reason. And when, when you, as you said, when you, when you don't have that uh, and you become complacent, then that's when, then the big mistakes can happen. So in certain instances where it's more high risk, yeah, I try to uh, keep that going. And try to hey stay consistent with it, but also uh, stay confident and like you have to follow through because if you let that fear grip you and affect your performance, and especially in high stakes scenarios, yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be a bad day. You need to be on your game. Okay, now before we take a break here, uh, let tell us how, how do you pay the bills these days? You're a you're a grad student, I understand, and uh, you're also. Ooh. You're active in the air. So how do you, how do you, how are you financing these endeavors? Okay. Um, I, so I, I actually do 
a little bit better than the average uh, grad student. I uh, wrote my own grant uh, for my research and uh, for a, an organization that I founded, Veterans in STEM, which I actually manage, and that does support me as well. Um, uh, the university has uh, um, programs and stuff that support me. Um, I have, I think, three scholarships uh, that don't uh, conflict with each other. But on top of that, I do consulting for companies in tech at Beverly Hills area and stuff, which they do. They pay pretty well. Um, and also, I am an instructor, a, wings, a professional wingsuit instructor. So I teach um, uh, the wingsuiters here and I manage uh, Scott of Elsinore's wingsuit community uh, as well. So uh, that does bring in a good amount of income. So I would say my skydiving activities pay the aggregate activity of wingsuiting itself pays for itself if not um, more so i just you know live like a regular individual with the whatever i have left now z that sounds like you're really busy that sounds like a lot there's a lot going on right there yeah yeah you got that right yeah 100 percent, a lot all right. Hey, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to hear about some of those uh, adventures in the skies and really the you know, drill down into the difference between uh, airplane based uh, airplane, airplane wingsuiting versus base uh, wingsuiting. So stay tuned for that. We'll be right back. And welcome back. We are talking to Z, who is a wingsuit base jumper, among other things many other things, very busy guy, but I would love to hear, okay, you're out of the service. Did you do any, did you do any parachuting skydiving in the service? I did. Um, so my unit had to get certified for airborne, uh, which is the army airborne school. And to be quite honest, uh, I don't really count that, but uh, it is, you do jump out of a plane. It's really low to the ground. It might as well be a base jump. Um, and you have a parachute that's round that has no directional steerability. The entire time at airborne school, they teach you how to fall properly, uh, called a proper landing fall, a PLF uh, for short. And um, you, you never really actually do a PLF in real life. You just crash down to the ground, hit it at whatever velocity the wind is taking you. So um, I did that for six jumps, uh, six or seven jumps. And uh, before... Uh, I was supposed to go to multi-mission parachute to get my gold wings and my free fall. I got out and went to uh, Penn State for chemical engineering. So, yeah, it started in the military with uh, airborne school. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's let's keep with that theme. There. Let's go with the evolution of the types of parachutes uh, or or um, free fall devices that you you have gone through so you went started with the round the round parachute with no no control whatsoever you're just falling you're floating through the air yeah. what what when you when you got out of the service and you're doing this as a as a private citizen what what kind of parachutes are you now using so we have kind of ram air yep we have ram air parachutes and the military has these as well but large ones ram air parachutes are directional and steer built you have, they fly just like wings. They force air in the front and that creates a semi-rigid profile, which allows you to fly through the air. Um, but the round parachutes, you're just creating drag to slow you down. Um, but with these parachutes, you're actually flying like a wing. So that's why the front of the parachutes are always open uh, to force air in and the backs are closed. So with that, um, I start off with a big uh, parachute um, just because new students don't have the fine motor skills for or the experience to uh, time flares and whatever. And you come down at quite a high speed when your wing loading is high, meaning that your body weight and your the surface area of what is covering you um, has is low or high when it's higher you come down faster because you're loading the wing much uh, more fiercely so we had big parachutes low wings back then and then i started getting into um a 170 so about a one-to-one -one loading back then uh, which is uh, not aggressive there are wings there are flyers that three five three something uh, loading that are sweeping the ground at 60 miles per hour and it's coming down but that wasn't ever my thing I like to have a good amount of surface area over the top of me. 
uh, started with relative work, which is the belly jumping where you're flying straight when you're trying to take ducks and everything. Um, then I went to wingsuiting. Uh, wingsuiting, um, you have more time in the air. However, you want to have a more docile canopy just because the openings are a little bit more spicy. And that's why I teach these courses all the time where, um, yeah, that's what you see. It's like, oh, I got this nine cell canopy that's really, you know, high performance. So let's see how it opens. And they spin up a line twist on the opening. That's so right. I like because, I, because, because wingsuiters, I mean, you're not wingsuiting to the ground. I mean, there is you have to deploy no. a chute uh, before you hit the ground. 100% and you have to deploy the chute uh, that's relatively stable. There are chutes that are designed and trimmed much steeper that have a, a, a that are much more sporty. And of course, sportiness is not exactly uh, consistent with a wingsuit. You want to have docile, so you have openings that are on heading. So I started downsizing a little bit, then I upsized actually when I got to wingsuiting from 150 to 170 just to get something more docile. And now I'm back to 150. Uh, same ram air parachute system, but just a little bit uh, on the sportier side, on the high end side of the sport. So now I have all wingsuit specific gear. Everything's wingsuit specific because that's all I do now. Okay. A couple, couple follow-up questions here. How many, how many parachute mm -hmm. jumps, how many traditional parachute jumps did you have to do before you could qualify for wingsuit instruction? I mean, to, Ooh, not, uh, not, not to become an instructor, but to, you know, to start uh, receiving instruction on how to be a wingsuiter. Okay. That's much easier. Um, 200, uh, USB regulations. Yep. 200 is what you need to do in any discipline to get to this air, uh, get to this activity. Okay. And, uh, in the military, is there any military application to wingsuiting? Do, do, are there are there wingsuiters in the, in any military branch? Um, there are, but they're more uh, show for show. Uh, okay. They're not really tactical of any sort. I mean, at this point, um, if there are, I don't know of them, and most people don't know of them. But the thing is, there's really no tactical advantage or significant tactical advantage because you can't carry your, you can't carry um, certain objects and stuff because you are in a suit. You can only carry a certain a finite amount of uh, items. When you're free falling from a parachute, you have uh, much more gear associated that you can carry in front of you, like a hundred pound bag. If you can't carry that through the sky, now with that, um, you also have added risk. Wingsuiting is a much more exotic form of skydiving. Wingsuit skydiving which you need to be on your game and you can't just do one jump a month or one, whatever the, the minimum regulations are to be considered uh, proficient in it. You have to keep going. And it's a lot of jumps until you get to the point where it's like, Hey, I can carry additional items and stuff with it. So I don't think the military has any re real reason for it um, outside of, Oh, that, that looks really cool. And it was for show. Yeah. That makes, that makes total sense. Total sense. Now, when you are learning how to wingsuit, does everybody start with airplane wingsuit jumping? Is that the traditional way yes. to, to learn how to wingsuit? That is the safest way to learn how to wingsuit. Uh, the opposite, the other side of the house, the wingsuit base, is uh, way too dangerous. It would never want to learn on the mountains. Yeah, you want to be an expert in wingsuiting before ever uh, stepping foot on a mountain. Okay. So take us through quickly, you know, what is the, the difference between airplane wingsuiting and, and, uh, uh base wingsuiting, or I get, getting that backward wingsuit base. Um, yeah. Wingsuit base. Uh, I can yeah. deal with that. Uh, um, so it's, so the difference, the difference is, uh, quite considerable um wingsuit skydiving is a good entry point to learn how to fly and learn the techniques of wingsuiting in a very forgiving suit you usually start with a progression with a small suit uh i i generally fly squirrel products uh, that's one of the main brands and uh, you start off with something small um which is uh, maybe a swift or a sprint or something that has forgiving features that allow it to not have such performance that you can flip out to your back and just start spinning out of control. So you want to really, really hone in your skills um, and make like maybe 500 wingsuit skydives, even more than that, um, to be just proficient at every angle of attack, every little bit of it. You want to be so dialed in that you just 
you're more comfortable in a suit than without the suit, um, then you're, uh, you can make the step into the wingsuit base scene. But that's the better path to take. Some people rush it quite quickly and they usually find themselves scaring themselves to death or they find themselves dead, uh, one or the other. But um, uh, one thing that I have re recognized is that the skydiving scene is where you actually develop a lot of the finer skills and a lot of the skill set associated with wingsuit flying. Um, and I, I say this in terms of sheer skill, like a lot of the more technical components of wingsuiting, you learn in wingsuit skydiving. And uh, they're, they're usually not applicable in the wingsuit base scene. But if you go the other, other route where you do more wingsuit base jumps, when you go to wingsuit skydiving, uh, what I've noticed from personal experience is they don't really have the same level of uh, relative skill, especially with the new forms of wingsuit skydiving. So there's there's wingsuit wingsuiting in general, wingsuit base is a subdiscipline, and then a lot of the other disciplines are in the skydiving community. Um, so that's the difference I think is one is off a mountain, one is just out of plane. You have more time for one and less time for the other, and the gear that you use or the types of wingsuit that you use are also very specific. Yeah, I think I think uh, Moab Joe was talking to us about margin, and when you're jumping out of a plane. There's a lot of margin. You've got a lot of space mm -hmm. below you to experiment, try things. Something goes wrong. You've got time to to pull that chute and and have a a successful uh, landing. Whereas if you are jumping off of a mountain, uh, if you're doing wingsuit base, you have a lot less margin. And if something goes yeah. wrong, it goes wrong quick. Hundred uh, percent. The margin is very very much uh, smaller, especially in the U.S. Uh, usually the exits that are legal uh, legal are um, generally a little bit shorter uh, than what's available in Europe. Um, so, and the hike, and they're usually quite distant away from us. So the margin is a lot less. And Moab Joe for sure knows that uh, because his background or back backyard is all very, very low jumps um, in Moab, which um, I, I don't think a lot of people consider they're jumpable, but they're very, very risky in some cases. And you're starting right away or it's it's pretty bad. But yeah, margin is much smaller. And the types of flying is also different. The types of flying that is being are being performed in the wingsuit base scene are different than what is being performed in the skydiving scene. So I know if, if you are a rock climber and you're looking to do a remote feature, this you know incredible climb out there, you've got to pack your bag and you've got to do the hike in. Wingsuit base, very similar, right? If you've got if you've got a feature that you want to jump off, it's pretty remote. You, you're not, I mean, the flight itself is relatively short. You know, the majority of that experience is going to be hiking underweight uh, to this location to get up there and, and do what you want to do. Yeah, hundred percent. It's actually identical. I mean, everything that you bring in, you take out, and especially the trash. Uh, I I know back in the day they had some issues with uh, people throwing stuff on trails and stuff, uh, wings, or not wings, space, but base jump in general. But you basically take everything up and everything you take up, you bring down with you. Um, and you leave no traces or no evidence uh, up on the mountain like you should. So uh, yeah, ev everything comes with you. And that's why we pack light and we pack efficiently. Okay. Now, what is the longest approach that you've had to hike to, to get to, to get to a jump for you? Six or seven hours. Um, yeah. Uh, usually at that point, it becomes a little, it becomes a little bit less manageable because you bring your own water. And as you kind of tell, the more water you bring, the more tired you're going to get very quickly. So you can find streams, ponds, but some uh, areas and objects don't have those features. So it's, yeah, six hours, six, seven hours was where I, uh, I started becoming very much more tired yeah now is that is that six or seven hours does that correspond to 15 miles 20 miles 30 miles I don't, i'm not sure how, how fast you move out there Ooh, uh, it's you'd be surprised it's actually not a lot of mileage it's uh it could be seven to ten miles but it's a lot of altitude gain we usually take the shortest uh the most the quickest approach and mm -hmm. that sometimes has a lot of elevation gain and that yeah, that adds a lot of stress to, to to the entire situation. So 
I guess distance wouldn't be the best thing, but uh, I would say maybe seven to 10 miles. Uh, but elevation change of anywhere from like 2,000 to 4,000 feet as well. Yeah. Now, do you remember, and I'm sure the answer is yes, but do you remember your first uh, wingsuit base jump? Oh my God, yes. <laughs> yeah. Hey, take take us through that. T tell, tell us how that went. Oh my God. Uh, so training for wingsuit base in the Americas is very, very important. Um, I trained quite a bit, but I trained at sea level um uh, in the santa monica hills over there um and i got to mount bearing which is up in uh washington it's actually a very very it's an object that's actually legal for for now hopefully it stays that way um and it uh it was it was grueling it, that was actually worse the, one of the worst hikes i've i've still have been on um in the area and um yeah i wasn't acclimated to the place my um wingsuit base mentor was uh quite fast he's he's very fast uh, and I, i'm coming from a special operation background so I, i'm not like oh out of shape or anything so he, he was like a gazelle up this thing and yeah we were covering a three hour three and a half hour approach in about two and a half hours and uh yeah it was brutal uh, i have a natural disposition to cramp up um, if I, especially when I don't drink enough water and stuff in a new area, it's humid. It's, I was just a mess. I probably, uh, three quarters of the way up, I had the most severe cramps and I kept going. And then I, the, at that point, when I got to the exit, I was just done. And we have a certain time frame that we have to jump, uh, before the conditions become unjumpable or it's just not a good idea or you're going to end up staying on the mountain or climb back down. So out of that, I was just like, well, this is my first jump. Hopefully my legs don't cramp up. Uh, I try to extend my suit. Uh, hopefully I don't die. Um, but uh, yeah, it was scary. It was all of that, everything. Just you're mentally fatigued, physically fatigued, just like, oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here. And I'm just like, and the entire time you're just like, what am I doing with my life? Like, am I crazy? Like, I'm just not like, this is not what humans do. Um yeah, it was just, it was brutal. And it. I, I'm glad that I had that experience because now I know that, hey, you got to be on it and be physically fit, mentally fit, and create a way to make everything easier because my gear didn't fit uh, appropriately. It was not the optimal stuff for what I was actually um, jumping. I didn't bring enough water. I didn't bring enough food. And I didn't, I thought it was going to be an easier hike because I was like, ah, oh, three hour approach, that's easy but I forgot the elevation gain of 3,000 something feet. Um, yeah, very real. And I was just completely dead at the top. And I was like, well, I'm going to either jump off this thing or die on this mountain, on the top of this mountain. So uh, let's do this. So yeah, that was exhausted, exhausted, worried about cramping, just physically spent. Uh, the wingsuit was not was not the right type or didn't fit quite right. And, and yeah. you still, you still no. jumped off the mountain. No, the wingsuit fit perfectly. Uh, okay, that was okay. my, but, but some of the bags that I used to carry the item um, had um, features that dug into the skin and you're just um, um, burnt out, just completely like, just like red marks everywhere. It's Got like it. digging into the sides and it's like, oh, this is super light, but it's super inefficient. Uh, so yeah, that was, um, it was something else. Okay. Now, how long in time, how long in time was that first wingsuit base jump? Um, Like how long was the flight? Yeah. How long was the flight? Oh, seconds. Uh, probably like 30 seconds max. Uh, maybe even less than that. But uh, yeah, it was definitely not that long, but it, it was just amazing. And how much distance did you cover? Not, not uh, height, but how much, you know, out did you cover in that 30 seconds? Horizontal, yeah. Let's say probably like 9,000 feet, maybe. Um, less than that. Probably like six to 9,000, somewhere between there. So a mile, mile and a half? Uh, probably less than a mile. Okay. Yeah, probably 0.75 miles um, is probably what we actively covered. Um, just because we were just flying over, over uh, around uh, mountains. Nothing close, just, just flying out and flying over a lake and then opening. 
And when you landed, what were your first thoughts? Uh, it was like, what the hell does it do? I, oh my God, this is amazing. Like it was unreal. Like everything about it, just the entire mountainside, you were, you, like, you were just in paradise. Like it was just, it was absolutely unreal. Like you accomplished something so like brutal, climbing up the mountain, going up the whole thing, and then just almost dying on the way up and then jumping off it and surviving and coming back down and your train comes back and kicks in and you land safely and the next day you do it again okay do you have a a maybe a favorite jump or maybe a moment uh maybe a dangerous uh jump where you're like i i don't believe i lived through that any moments like that Ooh. or or a favorite a favorite story i know i know we talk a lot about type 2 fun on this on this podcast yeah. where you know, it wasn't enjoyable when it happened but boy you love telling the story about it afterwards I think one of my favorite jumps is um, so up at uh, up in um, the PNW Pacific Northwest. It's in the Northern Cascades. It's uh, it's a not a super technical. Uh, well, it's it's not one of those less jumps. It's definitely a little bit more a spicier jump. But basically, you have to jump off and do a subterminal turn left. But the reason why it's so amazing is. Uh, this is something that happens. We constantly look for these in base jumping. We look for thermic activity to force air up. When we have thermic activity back on the wall, which is getting heated, it forces air up the wall. As you jump off, it actually catches, it gives you positive feedback on your suit and inflates the suit fast. And when you start flying in that, you actually retain a massive glide ratio with a massive amount of speed. So this uh, jump, so Southern Early Winter Spires is what uh, the actual exit is. But it's in the Northern Cascades, beautiful location. Um, we hike up to it. There's a small climbing section where we um, basically scramble up uh, some stuff. And then we get to the exit and you launch off and do an instant uh, 90 left. You have to do that to get to fly the right direction. But you fly right next to the wall. And the wall is right to the left of you. And you're just flying very fast because the air is pushing you up. And it's giving you positive support. And you're just nuking down the side of the wall. Then you bank the corner to the right and you just fly over the this finger. Usually um, air converges at these uh, apex points, um, especially like if paraglider or something, they converge over there and usually provide a little bit of lift as well. So you're flying down this terrain and you detach and then you flare up and pitch. I got so uh, excited on that. I, I, we were flying so fast. You saw your shadow across the wall and then you're just nuking down the terrain and then you flare up. I got so excited that I actually flared aggressively. Everything you want to do is do, you want to do is slow and progressive to get the maximum efficiency in the suit. Um, I did so quickly that I almost went to high speed stall and I had to pitch right away. It wasn't dangerous, but it was like, oh, wow. I got so excited. But it was uh, definitely one of my favorite jumps. It's in the middle of like back country, not uh, super back country, but it's like really far up in the Northern Cascades and it's just beautiful. Um, very, very different environment. And you land on the side of the highway, unreal. That is wild. Absolutely wild. Now, you you said a couple times, I think, during the interview about legal legal jumps. And so I am imagining that there are, if there's legal, there's also illegal jumps, right? So what 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 makes a jump legal? Where is it illegal? Is it Are there more uh, illegal spots than, than legal? And, and what is your level of participation? Are you strictly a legal jumper? Oh, geez. Um, so what makes something illegal is actually the ordinance that is associated with whoever governs that land. Uh, if it's private property and they're okay with it, then yeah, you're, you're totally in your rights to it. Usually what they get you on is uh, aerial delivery. And that's what they get you at national parks, such as Yosemite, um, Mount, uh, Zion, um, any of those like major national parks uh, are illegal. Um, I honestly don't know why, uh, but their rapport back in the day when the space jumping uh, movement started was rather poor. They used to be legal and then they just shut it down because uh, individuals would just litter on the top of the mountains, party too hard and start dying left and right, um, which is bad for optics. Um, so the legal jumps are usually national parks and um, 
we try to avoid those um, if you can. However, I mean, some of the jumps are iconic. Like, I mean, what, what's at Yosemite? You can only guess um, the types of jumps you would see there. And have, have you been to Yosemite? Yep. I have a uh, few times. Um, yeah, it's a very amazing uh, location. Uh, no jumps, never, never jumped there. I, I, I wasn't um, going to ask you. I wasn't going to put you on the spot there. I just, oh, uh, you know, I just leaving it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Possible deniability. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, right. it's 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 an amazing location. Uh, honestly, if it was legal, I would be jumping there every day. Um, it's but uh, you want to respect uh, uh, what they have over there. The Rangers do a really good job at um, uh, keeping that place open for everyone and making the experience uh, oh, like available for everyone you don't want to mess that up so uh yeah half dome el cap uh tap point uh those are all amazing jumps and people have like i mean in reality yes people have jumped them if anyone is a climber they heard of dean potter um yeah he's the black raven of uh of yosemite and he did a lot of jumping there um yeah yeah, yeah, I was gonna there's... say I was gonna say that generally things are illegal, uh, especially at the federal level, if it, if the, the liability is too great. But then you know I think about uh, you know climbers. I mean, th- there's a high degree of liability with with climbers. There's a lot of danger with climbers, especially if you if you're doing you know free climbing. And so maybe that's not the reason. It's, maybe maybe it is the optics. Yeah, maybe it is the it's, uh, reputation. It's, it's... Definitely the optics. It's not like the liability for climbing. Honestly, I think it's there's so like there's free soloing that you can literally cl- climb a bell cap without a um, gear, and it's it's okay. You can make a movie about it. But I mean, it have people fly off the mountains. It from what I was told, and this is just like rumors and stuff. Um, so one, apparently, it's not consistent to all national parks. So you can actually petition to try to open up some areas uh but uh i don't think there's much traction there um going that route um with that i think the optics in terms of it, it what people say it takes away from the beauty of the nature of nature and you see someone just whizzing by in a red suit just popping over terrain and then opening and it's like oh my god wow this is amazing it starts i guess i guess i could see it becomes a little bit more of a circus than it is uh um like a, na- a natural activity. So they try to keep certain things to a minimum over there to retain that uh, natural beauty. However, it would be pretty awesome to jump off that stuff. All right. Well, what what's next for Z? What's what's the next big challenge out there? Do you have an iconic spot that uh, is legal that you're, you're aiming for in the near future? Yeah. we're go- So I'm actually leaving for the Pacific Northwest um, again. Um, actually tomorrow uh and driving up there and uh we're gonna do some jumping up in the mountains and basically leave off where i left off last time start off where i left off last uh, last season um there's a few interesting jumps there uh, moab joe is just there I, I see his uh instagram videos all the time um we'll see um there's a few jumps that i'm really interested in that we're gonna explore we might not jump all of them we might just go up and take uh, lasers and do our actual due diligence and homework, which is also an important component. But uh, yeah, we're going to start. We're probably going to go do a Ron Robin of our old jumps and then start these new jumps. And then after that, uh, I get back, uh, do a little bit of coaching, and then go off to Europe um, to the Brento. Mount Brento is where we usually start uh, all our um, jumping because it's such a massive object. Then I go to uh, Switzerland. Uh, oh, wait, we go to Sassbordoy before that, that Dolomite area. And then we go to Switzerland. And then maybe Wallenstadt and uh, those areas. Maybe just two weeks there. And then I get back and then start my job. Fantastic. Now, I, I forgot to ask earlier, what is your what is your dissertation on? Oh, uh, so it's kind of a mix. Um, so I started off with inorganic chemistry and inorganic synthesis, uh, basically making new molecules, uh, specifically in terms of energy. Uh, we were making new cathodes and uh, stuff with um, these uh, boron clusters, which are electroactive chemicals or electroactive molecules. Now, I migrated over to CO2 sequestration and geochemistry uh, because I see a lot of um, a great need and a, an importance in 
actively removing carbon emissions and uh, carbon dioxide from the atmosphere because of how important uh, that business is. We have to fix what we're doing with climate change. Like it's it's actually unreal. Um, so I migrated to that. And now uh, one part of my thesis is actually CO2, uh, CO2 sequestration into ultramafic sites or geological formations and using different probing techniques to determine sites that are of interest. And the other one is uh, building paleo uh, paleo climate archives uh, using terrestrial cave carbonate. So basically creating uh, archives of where we've been in the past to inform where we're going in the future with this uh, climate change. Well, that is hugely important. It's something we, we really need to pay attention to and and find some solutions. It's it's uh, we're, we are seeing the effects of climate change um, all over the place, all over the world. And uh, so your dissertation is not directly related to wingsuit wingsuit base jumping. Not at all. I but, but do a lot of different things. <laughs> you, you are a renaissance man. Absolutely. Yeah. Hey, Z, you know where we are? Uh, where... where... No idea. No idea. Uh, we are at the. Actually, Toy you're going to ask me a question. Of the week. That's right. Uh, Toy tip inside of the week. It's that time of the episode where you're going to share some outdoor adventure wisdom with our listeners to make their next experience even better. What do you have for us? Okay, so I think it's important to develop grit and develop a diverse set of experiences and diverse set of skill set. That's why you see my background. I never really specialize in one thing. Even the PhD program, I migrate to different components of it, of science. It's important to have a very, very broad background and applying that into the outdoor environment. Like if you know how to climb, learn how to uh, do mountaineering, learn how to do trad, learn how to do sport climbing, learn maybe paragliding. Every single activity that you do out in the real world, it's going to make you better at navigating it. And it's going to keep going. Developing grit is the most important thing uh, that I think. And developing that broad list of experiences to inform what you're doing. So uh, a book that's uh, very good is um, this town takes an outside approach, not just outdoors. Uh, Range by David Epstein. Um, very good book that talks about the importance of diverse experiences um, when traversing wicked domains he, did, he breaks down two domains wicked and kind kind being very very uh, rule-based meaning that you can play ten thousand hours of keyboards or piano and be an expert or, or master at it however if you perturb that environment in one way and turn it into a wicked domain then any pertur a perturbation will uh, like cause that individual to not be able to perform like that and the real world outdoors is a wicked domain it's very very complex there are things out there that you can't control and you need to learn how to adapt to them and go with the flow rather than try to control them because they're not going to be like that. So there's a small saying that we have in Wingsuit Base that I actually took from one of my mentors. Always do what the mountain says and you're a guest of the mountain. Um, and I go with that. So my diverse set of experiences allow me to, I guess, be a good guest. And I never I go against it or try to get my way but I can navigate it because I have a diverse set of experiences and skill set. Fantastic. That, that was, uh, that's incredible. Grit is such an important skill. It's such an important trait uh, to have. I don't think anything worth accomplishing was ever done without some measure of grit. Yep. 100%. Okay. So there you have it. That's it. This episode is just about in the books. Hope our listeners enjoyed our time with Z. Want to thank him for joining us this week. Z, how can our listeners keep up with you on social media and where can they find updates on your latest adventures? Oh, um, yeah, I actually have a YouTube channel. You can, uh, it's actually the same as my um, uh, Instagram handles, which I believe you have ZPAC123456789. I know I made it a long time ago. And I also manage the wingsuit account for my drop zone, Wingsuit Elsinore. So Wingsuit Skydiving, that's the place to find our footage and all our adventures. Uh, and for myself, ZPAC123579, I will be on Instagram. And uh, yeah, uh, if you have the time, please follow. And you can follow my adventures there, Wingsuit Base and Wingsuit Skydiving. And ZPAC is spelled how? 
Z E E P A K. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Remember to check out the pod on social media as well. We are on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok. And if you have comments or clips you want to share, you can send it to me at johnfreakingmirror at gmail.com. The Adventure Media Recommendation. Z, I'm also looking to you to share a recommendation for a book, which you already did, but I want another one here. Oh, geez. A book, a movie, oh. documentary, some some kind of adventure media to keep our listeners connected to outdoor experiences. Do you have something else or was that was that the one you were planning on sharing? Oh, damn. That was the one I was planning on sharing. <laughs> um, let's see. Um, How about you said YouTube. When I asked you YouTube or Netflix, you definitely said YouTube. Is there a, not not your YouTube channel, but is there an, another YouTube channel that you find yourself going down the rabbit hole uh, looking at content? Oh, my God. It's really difficult. I, I mean, outside of informational videos for rooms and skydiving, I guess I just watch. I watch what really keeps me moving. Uh, like I've always watched the remixes of wingsuit lines and everyone doing all the flying and stuff. I think that's really um, important to me. And yeah, I guess any wingsuit compilation video or maybe your trip or even Dreamlines by Yoki Summers, uh, like th those videos really keep me going. Like it's beautiful. Life is beautiful. And um, I would just like to keep living it uh, to the fullest and that those videos really did polarize me to get into this what have we not asked you okay half calf that's a little obnoxious there but uh before we wrap things up just one more segment for you called what have i not asked you that you're dying to tell us about what, what did we miss during the interview tonight oh uh i don't know i think you got everything uh yeah, no, I think I shared everything that I want. Oh, my, just no cooch at the end now. Yeah, I think uh, we got everything. Okay. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, Veterans in STEM? You're, you're, is it a nonprofit? Oh, yes. Uh, so Veterans in STEM is an organization that I started um, in uh, at UCLA. It's a organization that actually helps veterans who are in STEM fields and migrating into that field to make the connection with academia and um, and uh, STEM in general. There are a lot of hurdles and a lot of hurdles that veterans have to face when they get out of the transition out of the service. And four years plus away from academic environments and communities is going to put you at a negative off the bat. So what we do is we provide veterans with opportunities for this. Actually, we're an NSF funded organization that uh, is, we're looking to create a methodology for integrating veteran resources and the academic resources at these major institutions and finding an efficient way to bridge those together so we can find a favorable pathway for veterans to migrate into the STEM field. And uh, yeah, it's something that I'm very passionate about. And we've been um, in our second rounds of uh, our collection for uh, grants and everything. We want to support more veterans in this uh, field. Um, so definitely be on the lookout for that because um, we are trying to do big things with that. That's fantastic. And you mentioned UCLA. Are you are you currently enrolled at UCLA getting your doctorate? I am in my last month at UCLA finishing my dissertation. Actually, I'm pretty much done with all the writing. I'm just going to be formatting for the most part. Then I'm done. And I'm starting work uh, right down the road. Fantastic. Thank you. That, uh, Thank you very much. You no, know, I, I feel like we are we are bonded because that's where I got my doctorate was UCLA. Epic. Very, very cool. Go yep. Bruins. Go Bruins. All right. Hey, we wish you uh, all the best in all of your many, many endeavors. Uh, you've got a lot of irons in the fire and you're, you're doing a great job in all of them. Um, this is a, it's a, it's not, this is a wrap from the John freaking Muir studio. Any shout outs to friends and family Z? Oh, uh, I guess shout out. Uh, yeah, I actually do. Uh, shout out to my parents for sticking up with all everything. And and Rana Parvez, uh, and thank you for everything. And all my friends that actually, uh, yeah, I'll give a shout out to uh, Graham Hall, Cameron Chapman, um, uh, Lauren Evans, um, for saving my life way too many times. Um, and yeah, thank you for saving me for drowning, uh, almost drowning that one time at Baring when I landed in the lake with a wingsuit and getting me out of the thorn bush. So 
yes, that, there's video somewhere with that. But these guys have been with me in all these adventures. And I thank everyone else um, that has been with me uh, through thick and thin. So, yeah, shout out to all of you guys. Um, I'll see you guys in the mountains. Nice. Now, Z, I have to say that, you know, we've, we've gone through the whole episode here. We've talked about, you know, potential stories and you know, high moments, low moments. And it's only at the very end in your shout outs that I hear that you almost drowned in a lake uh, in a wingsuit incident. Oh, so you're going to have to come back on the podcast again and tell us that story. Yeah, for sure. For sure. For okay. Sure, yeah. All right. Well, hey, thank you for tuning in. Always remember the trail is the trail. It doesn't care if you want to go downhill. It doesn't care if it's almost dark and you're looking for a campsite. It doesn't even care if you're exhausted, sore, and on the verge of cramping up and you're about to jump off the mountain. The trail is the trail. Embrace the suck.